Hi, my name is LaToya and I volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this message. It is because of people just like you that we are able to expand our reach for the kingdom. If you would like to give to the efforts of Set Free Church or to Set Free Missions, please visit setfree.cc slash give for more. If there's anything we can do to serve you, please feel free to contact us, 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfree.cc. Again, thank you so much for watching. Enjoy. Well, I got something I want to talk to you about tonight. Uh, something that's a very real fact of being a Christian. And, and, and I have to admit that I've missed it in this area at some time. But then I've hit it sometimes too. Amen. Go with me over into the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And we will start and around. Let me see when I get there where I want to be. Luke chapter 19. And we'll start with verse 41. Verse 41. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. We're coming down to the crucifixion. In verse 41 it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Jesus sitting up on the hill, overlooking Jerusalem, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, that your enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, which happened in 70 A.D. when the Romans conquered Jerusalem. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Look at here. Here's where I want to be right here. Because thou knewest not the time of your visitation. You, you, if you had only known what belonged to you right now in this day, oh, the peace you could have lived in. But since you didn't even recognize the time of your visitation, you're going to be completely destroyed. You're going to be completely destroyed. So I want to talk to you tonight about the time of your visitation or, or being aware of the time of your visitation or don't miss the time of your visitation. And we could give it several more titles, but we're going to talk about the time of your visitation tonight. I went, I, I went to the dictionary. Webster says this. says visitation is a, listen to this, is a special dispensation of divine favor. Visitation in the Bible here means a special dispensation of divine favor. How many of you could use a new dispensation of favor in your life? A special dispensation of divine favor. In the Greek, the word, in the Greek, the word visitation says this. That act which God having looked into and searching out the ways and the deeds of an individual releases their lot accordingly. That see, how we live our lives brings times of visitation. And if we're not aware, we can miss our time of visitation. Listen, let, me, let me read you just a few more scriptures about visitation, then I'm going to talk to you about it. Over in Genesis, I just want to establish this principle that there's a time of visitation in your life, and you need to be aware of it. Amen. Over in Genesis chapter 50 and uh, verse 24. In Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24 is a most interesting, a most interesting scripture. Joseph speaking to Israel. They're in bondage now. They're in bondage to Egypt. And Joseph in verse 24 said, said unto his brother, I die. And watch now, a time of your visitation. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swear to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Hey, boys, I'm about to die. I'm going to die right here. We're in bondage, and I'm going to die right here in bondage. But I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to leave you in bondage. He will visit you and bring you out of this land. And then look what he said right here. In the next verse, he said, 
Uh, and Joseph took an oath, verse 25, with the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. You know what he was saying? He said, listen, I, I, I'm, we're in bondage right now, but I know that we serve a God that will give us a visitation. He said, and what I got shut up in my bones, God didn't put in me for me to, to, to be resurrected right here in this land of bondage. I got something on the inside of me. I might be in some bondage right now, but even if it's after I die, what I got on the inside of me, God's going to visit me. He said, when y'all go marching out of this land, you dig up my bones and take them with you because I got the Holy Ghost on the inside of my bones and I'm not getting up in the middle of this curse. I'm getting up in the middle of the promised land and I come by tell you tonight, you might be having a hard place in your life right now. You might be going through something that seems like a curse but that Jeremiah said you got fire shut up in your bones. You got more on the inside of you. You cannot stay in that place and God will visit you surely and get you out of it. So I want to read you another scripture. Go with me over to Luke chapter 1 verse 67. I'm just laying a little groundwork before we talk about it. Luke chapter 1 and verse 67. A time of your visitation. Luke 61. Luke 1, 67. And his father Zacharias, was talking about John, was filled with the Holy Ghost. And prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. Jesus Christ was a visitation of God the Father. It was a season. It was a, it was a, um, it was a, uh, a divine dispensation of favor. Luke chapter 7. Go over to there. Luke chapter 7. Look at verse 15 and 16. Luke chapter 7. Jesus just said to a dead boy, young man, I say unto you, arise. Verse 15, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak. I'd like to hear what a dead boy that had done been in paradise sat up and said. Can you imagine he had been dead and in paradise and Jesus resurrected him? He probably, got, he probably sat up and pointed to Jesus and said, oh, y'all don't know who this is. Oh, you ain't going to believe where i just been. Oh, my God. And he says, and, and he began to speak, and he delivered them to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen among us, and that God hath visited his people. Ecclesiastes says this. Says there's a, Ecclesiastes 8 and, and 5 says there's a time and a season for every purpose under the earth. There's a time and a season Time to be born, time to die. He just goes through a whole list. But there's a time of visitation for every purpose. Jesus swept over Jerusalem. He said, you missed the time of your visitation. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5, I talked about this here a few weeks back, says that a wise man's heart discerneth both times and seasons. A wise man's heart discerneth times and seasons. What season are you in in your life? And what time is it in the spirit in your life? See, here, here's what I want to tell you. As you serve God as you go through the years, not every moment is equal. Not every day with Jesus is the same day. Not every moment is equal. There are days that there are a time of visitation. And we should understand that those times are, are a wake-up call. When, God began, when, when the mulberry bushes begin to shake, and when the still small voice begins to speak, and you was looking in the earthquake, and you was looking in the fire, and you was looking in the thunder, but the still small voice begins to speak, and you begin to sense that there's something going on different, that God's he's, he's ruffling the covers, if you will. Here's what I have found out. You do not decide when God's going to move. You respond to Him when He does move. Amen. And you don't want to miss the time of your, your visitation. If God's moving in your life, how do I know he's moving? If he's doing a new thing, it's usually just a gentle whisper. But if he's moving in your life and you treat it lightly, and, 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 and you don't treat it with respect, and you just do as you please instead of listening to the time of your visitation, you can miss out on everything that God has for this season. And the problem is, when you miss a season, 
and you don't get the goodness out of one season, you can't get over here in the dis- next season of blessing till this season's over with. So you're going to be stuck without the goodness of God till that whole season would have, would have, hello, somebody. You've got to say, God, give me an ear to listen to you so I'll know the time of my visitation. You can miss your moment when you don't respond to God, listen now, in that moment. Because usually a time of visitation begins with a moment when God's talking to you. Remember, uh, if you're not careful, God can send the time of visitation, a, a, a divine dispensation of favor in your life. God can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this in your life. I'm going to raise you up to a different level. I want to take you to a different place in the Spirit. I want to do great things in your life. You remember the, the, the young man that came to Jesus and said, Lord, what, I, what I, I've done this, I've done that, I've done all this, I've gave everything, I've kept the commandments, la da 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 But he was rich. And Jesus said to him, go sell all that you have and come follow me. He, he, he didn't tell nobody else, come follow me except the twelve. What he said to this boy was, you can be one of my disciples, come follow me. He... The time of his visitation came, and his visitation would have put him in apostleship with Jesus. But your Bible said he heard that. He knew that there was a a dispensation of favor there that God was offering him. But he went away sad because he was rich. He, he He couldn't get past his money and his belongings and his properties He let that stand in the way of him stepping into what God wanted him to do. Well, wasn't that unfair, Brother Steve? God told him to sell everything. God knew he was rich. See, here's what I found out. Only Jesus knows how to deal with you in the very area that you got standing in the way. And he will hit you with something that you don't even like getting hit with because he knows that's what's standing in your way. He didn't tell Peter to go sell all he had when he said, come follow me. Because after Peter backslid, he still had his fishing boat, still had his business. But this one guy, he said, go sell it all because he knew what was in the guy's way. And the guy let that stand in the way of his visitation. He missed his moment. He let his possessions get in his way. You've got to make up your mind that you're going to get in the moment of your visitation regardless of how inconvenient it is. Because I have found out when God's doing something new, it's usually not convenient. I'm going to talk to you about that. I, I read a story, David Livingston, some of you have heard of David Livingston. He left his heart in Africa. He was a great missionary that, that loved African people. And uh, he received a letter from his denomination. And the letter says, do you, this is headquarters, says, do you have a road, roads that lead back to where you are? We have men who want to come and help. He read that letter and he wrote them one back and he said, if they got to have a road, I don't need them. I need men who will come with us a road or not a road. Think about that. If they're going to get into their destiny, they can't let stuff stand in the way. Anytime God does a time of visitation in your spirit, you can, you can look around, look at circumstances, look at everything, and talk yourself right out of it. Over in 2 Kings, talking about a time of visitation, watch this. Over in 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. And we'll start with verse 14. Now Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha, was falling sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and, and wept over him and said, Oh my father, my father, the chariot of Israel. And the horseman thereof. He spoke to Elisha's anointing because remember that's what Elisha said when Elijah went up. Oh my father, my father, the horseman, the chariot of God. And he received that mail and received the double portion. So the king went down and said, you anointed man of God. And Elijah said unto him, take a bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put your hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. The, he, the king of Israel does this. Elijah puts his hand on the, on the king's hand. 
And watch now. And in verse 17, he said, open the window eastward. He opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, who was their enemy. For thou shalt smite the Syrians till thou hast consumed them. He prophesied to him. That, listen, for years they had been being raided by Syria. They had been fighting with Syria. I mean, Syria was the major thorn in their flesh. And Elisha prophesied to him, you're going to consume them. But then look what he said. He said, take the arrows. He went out and picked them up. And he said to the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice three times and stayed. And the man of God was wrought and said, You should have smitten five or six times. Then thou had smitten Syria till thou had consumed it. Whereas now you will smite Syria but thrice. What he said is, you're going to fight them three times and you're still not going to consume them. Why did he get mad? What was that about? I'm talking to you about your time of visitation. Why did he get mad? He prophesied to him, you're going to get the victory. Shoot the arrow. That's the arrow of deliverance. Go get that arrow and smite the ground. The word there means beat it violently. Get your war and spirit on. And, and the king went out, picked up the arrow, and went bam, bam, bam. And it ticked Elisha off. Then he turned around and prophesied, there ain't going to be no victory. There ain't going to be no victory in your life. Hey, here's what I'm telling you. When your time of visitation comes and you know God spoke to you, you better take his word. Hear me what I'm telling you. You better take the things of the Spirit of God seriously. The king tapped it three times as if he was half-hearted into this victory. And it was almost as if he was treating the word of the Lord as if it was nothing. The prophet said, you should have beat the ground. This is really what, if you could put it in today's language, he was saying this. Since you don't have no enthusiasm, since you didn't take that prophecy seriously, since you didn't get excited over the word of the Lord, and you thought it was just another Sunday, just another sermon, you could take it or leave it, you just went through the motions, when you should have exploded over the word of God. But since you had no passion, since you wasn't gripped with the promise, since you had no zeal toward it, since it didn't inspire you to fight, they're going to beat you. They're going to beat you. you not, not, not all moments are equal, church, in your walk with God. Not all moments are equal. And, and, and they sometimes you can be cool, Magoo, but they sometimes you better put your armor on and you better say, bless God. He didn't bring me this far to let me down. He didn't start this work in me not to finish it. And if it's a fight we got to have, then I love a good fight anyway. We're going to whoop some devil if we have to. But, but we're not giving up. And, 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 and he said, you're not going to win. Listen, let me tell you this. I said, not all moments are equal. In your life, they are what I will call Holy Ghost intersections. There's crossroads that bring in the time of your visitation. Uh, I, I read this to you. I, I read it the other week. Let's, let's go over there. Five months back I read this. But I want you to understand this because I, go to Ecclesiastes. I don't want you to miss your time of visitation. Let me tell you something. I have looked back over my life, and I have seen times when the crossroads of my life intersected and God prevented, presented a great opportunity and I either didn't have enough sense to know it, I was too dull to understand it spiritually, or I felt too inferior to step into it. That's what keeps most of us out of stepping into that time of visitation is we feel inferior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, 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 look what he said. You should, have, you should have had some zeal, man. I prophesied to you. And you treated it like, like you could take it or leave it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, in verse 11, he said, I return and saw unto the sun. The race is not to the sweet. You don't have to be the fastest to win. The battle not to the strongest. You don't have to be the strongest to win the battle. 
Yet bread to the wise, you don't have to be the wisest guy in, in town of success. Riches to the man of understanding. Now, favor the man of men is given. Watch now. I'm talking about your time of visitation. I talked about this a few weeks ago, but I want to hit it here. He says, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Intersections of life, Holy Ghost intersections of life, where your time of visitation, the opportunity presents itself. He says here, time. Time means a season, but it means a succession of events. A succession of events that brought you to an appointed time. Time and chance. Chance means in the Hebrew, when the opportunity presents itself. See, there are successions of events that happen in your life that push you down the road toward the place of your visitation And the succession of events that happened in your life, you might not have wanted them to happen. When it was happening, you might have thought, oh my God, this is terrible. But when time collides with chance, and you wouldn't be at the place of chance the opportunity presented, if you hadn't had the succession of events that put you down there, when time collides with chance, that's your season of visitation. Am I making sense to you? Yeah, that's your season of visitation when time collides with chance. And you, and you know what? And you don't always control that. No, you, you don't always control that. You don't always control that. And I'm going to tell you something else that I have found out about times of visitation. A time of visitation, when God's going to do it, it never, I said it earlier, it never seems to be at a convenient time. When God sends His time of visitation, when He sends His season of divine change and divine favor in your life, it never seems to come at the right time, starting out. For instance, Israel had been 40 years in the wilderness. It's time to go into Canaan and take Jericho, the first city, take it down and, and go into their inheritance. And God said, go cross the river now. The river was flooding. It was running over its banks. The river only floods about three weeks out of the year. Why are you bringing us to this river in one of the three weeks out of the year telling us to cross it while it's flooding? I mean, God, there's 11 months left. No, this is your time of visitation. Move now, but God, it's flooding. It's, it always it never makes a time of visitation begins. It never makes sense sometimes. And let me tell you something. Take that story a little bit further. Those priests with the ark. He said. He said to them. Said when your priest's feet hit the water, I'll dry it up. Yes. They're thinking we're going to step down in the water and the water's going to go away. Study it out. Those priests. It, it takes faith to, to step into your time of visitation. Those priests stepped into that water. And the water dried up 20 miles upstream at the city of Adam, they call it. You can't see a river 20 miles upstream. They got into obedience and stepped into that water with that ark on their back. God told us when we step in here, this is going to dry up. This is our time of visitation. This is the worst time in the world. We're going to be trying to cross this river. And they stepped into that river and the water kept running. How long does it take 20 miles of river to run back? And they stood there in faith because God had told them, this is your season of visitation, and when you step in, I'll dry it up. Let me tell you something. When, when God starts a season of visitation in your life, and you start to step forward with it, and it looks like it's crazy, and nothing's working right, and you don't know why in the world God's doing this, you don't know 20 miles, you don't see what He's already done, and you just you, you got to get, get in place for when, when time and chance collide so you're in the right place. How many times have you had something happen in your life and, and you look back and go, okay, finally, now I understand. I understand what that was now. I understand that. If you miss that moment, you miss your visitation. All of God's visitations in your life are tied to a time and a moment and a season and a, and a decision. Esau and Jacob are a good example. 
Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Esau and then Jacob. Esau was the firstborn. I'm talking about you better treat your time of visitation with respect and be aware of it or you will miss it. And so here we go. Esau, and, and, and Esau was a hunter. He was an outdoorsman. Jacob liked to stay at home and cook and read books and all that kind of stuff. Esau could cure. He wasn't interested. I, I, in my mind's eye, I can see these boys growing up. Isaac and Esau and Jacob sitting around the campfire. And Jacob's, I mean, uh, Isaac's telling them stories. He's telling them stories about how their grandfather, Abraham, how God spoke to him in the land of Ur, Iraq. He said, come out. I'm, I'm going I'm to make a view of people and how he promised them that, that, that Canaan's land and how, how God had done miracles and how, how, how even Isaac, how God had provided the ram in the bush where Abraham didn't kill me. And, excuse me. And, 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 and how he told him, said, the, God told, told your granddaddy to be looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And, it's God, and, and all these wonderful promises. And he, he told your granddaddy that, that he'll bless his seed and he'll bless those that bless him and he'll curse those that curse him. Boys, y'all are blessed. Boys, we got a covenant. Boys, God has moved in our family. You're in the middle of a time of visitation. Both boys heard the same story. Jacob was excited about it. He, he, he wanted to know about the family covenant. Tell me more about God, Daddy. But Esau was the firstborn. He got the double blessing because he was firstborn. Esau could have cared less about it. He didn't have no respect for the move of God. He's thinking about hunting. He's thinking about that little girl down the street, two tents down. He wasn't excited about all this God stuff, this covenant stuff. He wanted other things. Things consumed his... He was so consumed with things that he couldn't even understand his daddy was telling them, we are in a middle of a visitation of God. God is using our family to raise up a nation. God has promised to bless us. One's enthusiastic about the things of the Spirit. One's all carnal-minded. The problem with that is the time of Esau's visitation came when, he, when Isaac's dying, Esau would have inherited the promise. And, and the nation of Israel would have been through the lineage of Esau. His children would have been the tribes of Israel. He, he, would, he, he would have been blessed beyond. But the Bible, when it talks about it now, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's 12 children became Israel. Jacob's children are the ones that walked in the time of visitation that God promised Abraham. So, so here they go. Uh, Isaac's dying. And it's time for the blessing to pass down. Esau's been out hunting and he comes in hungry. I'll, 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 let me just read this to you. Go over to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. And uh, verse... Where I want to be. Genesis 25 and verse. Uh, go to verse 36. No, verse 30, excuse me. He comes in hungry. Jacob's cooking some pottage. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray you, with that red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom, which is red. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright. Whoa, wait a minute. Esau says, all he can think about is, I'm hungry. I'm consumed with what my flesh wants. And Jacob said, okay, give me that birthright. Hey, listen, if God sends a time of visitation to you and wants to do something strong and annoying in your life, and you don't respect it and don't receive it, Somebody around you would get it. I get it if I can. <laughs> Somebody wants it. Somebody would get it. And, and, and read on. Read on here. He said. He said, uh, "Where am I at?" He said, "Give, give me your, your birthright." And Esau, watch, watch this guy. Watch how he missed the time of his visitation. Behold, I'm at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? Are you? 
kidding me? I, my flesh is screaming at me. And here's what the margin in my Bible says. says that when he says, I'm at the point now, what profit shall this birthright do to me? How's anything spiritually going to matter to me if I don't have my material needs met? Well, isn't that backward? I mean, backward? How, how something, <laughs> right over y'all's head. How, how is how something spiritually going to matter to me when I don't have everything taken care of in the flesh? I'm hungry. I'm about to die. I got to do this first. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. But if you put all them things first before you got time for God, am I preaching to somebody here? If you put things first and, and, you, and you got to take care of things before you can ever take care of the God in your life, you're going to miss God. You know, Jacob later on, after he got that birthright, he went in went back in and uh, was digging some wells uh, where Abraham had dug wells. And the Bible says he came into town and the first thing he did was he built an altar, then he pitched a tent, and then he dug, him and his men dug wells. Watch this. First thing he did was he built an altar. That his relationship with God. Yeah. Then he pitched a tent. That was his relationship with his family. If your relationship with God is not first, your relationship with your family is never right. And then, he, then they started digging wells. That was his occupation. If your job is before your wife, your spouse, if your job is before your God, then you're backwards again. You will miss what God's trying to do. Amen. Sell me that birthright. Yeah, man, I, I, it, it ain't nothing to me. I, I got I to meet the needs of my flesh. He, listen, he sold out. He, 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 how can I say this? He lost a mountain of blessing for generations after him. He lost a mountain of blessing over a bowl of beans. That's what it was, a bowl of red beans. And he threw away his whole family's heritage over a bowl of beans. And I wonder how many times we let little nothing, f how, how many times have you seen somebody let a drink or a drug throw away two or three generations after him? How many times have you seen somebody let unforgiveness or bitterness get up in them and they throw away their whole relationship with God? You better, you better, listen, when the still small voice speaks, you need to give that thing some respect. If he, he, because he didn't value it, he lost it. Let me say that again. If we don't value it, we lose it. If the move of God in your life is not the most important thing, if, that, if, if I don't value the Holy Spirit in me more than I value anything else, then I'll lose Him. Because I, I don't know about you, but in my everyday life, I mean, we all have a devil that we deal with, and we all have opportunities, and we all could get into this and get into that. But it comes down to this, Lord God, I don't want to take any action where I'm going to lose your Holy Spirit out of my life. I value his visitation. And, and yeah, I'm not every day is a, a full-blown day of great blessing and anointing, and, and some days I don't even feel like I'm saved. But I know this, that through the years and through the times, I, if I keep valuing that thing, there's times and seasons, and I might be in an off-season right now, but I'll get back in it again before it's over with. Hey, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Please, just the one back to if you if you if you decide you're gonna be in church, then be in church. Don't show up once a month. Make it priority. If you decide you're gonna be a person of praise, then give God praise whether you feel like praising Him or not. You don't come in here on Sunday to see if you feel like praising God. You enter into His gates with praise. If you're going to be a Christian, be a real Christian. If you're going to be at Set Free, be excited about Set Free. Or don't get in our way. Amen. 
in Revelation 3 and 16, the Lord said, because you was lukewarm, I spewed you out of my mouth. You, can't, you cannot serve God half-hearted. You, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to halfway serve God, you'd be better off going back out in the world so you can get saved again and really do it right. You hear what I'm saying? Because I think, I think when I was out in the world, I knew I was lost. But I think there's people in church that are about halfway lost that think they're right that aren't right. And that's more dangerous to think you're right speaking in tongues and huckabucking and got all kind of junk in your life than just be out in the world and know you're a heathen. Amen. Don't nobody go back out into the world. You girls don't go back out into the world. I know what I'm saying. But do it with your whole heart. Don't miss what God would do for you. David, you know, David had his problems. But uh, David, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And boy, he knew how to worship. He knew how to praise God. And I think about that story. David, you know, the, you know the story. The ark of God was the anointing of God, the presence of God in Israel. And the Philistines stole it. And David, because Israel got sin in the camp, so God's presence left, and the Philistines stole the ark. So David went to get it. And you know the story. The cart shook, and the brother reached up and touched it, and God struck him dead because they were trying, listen, they were trying to get the anointing back the wrong way. God had told them in Leviticus, you put, you put listen to what I'm about to say, you put two um, big long sticks, what you call them, yeah, poles through there and, and, and on each side of it, and you put it on the shoulders of the priest, and don't nobody touch it. You let them, you let them two priests, one before and one behind, carry that anointing back into Israel. If you're going to set up under somebody, you better hope they got some kind of anointing on their lap. Right? And, 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 and they put it on a cart. You can't, you, can't, you can't get God's blessing and anointing on your life doing it your way. You have to do it God's way. You have to do it God's way. And they put it on a cart, and the cart shook, and the brother touched it, and God struck him dead. And it freaked David out, and he took it down. Tell me, somebody tell me who he took it to. Do you all know? Tell me the man's name. Obed-Edom. Took it down to Obed-Edom's house. Boys, I want to preach all that about Obed-Edom's dressing room floor and the ashes and all that. But I'm not going to go into that. He took it down to Obed-Edom's house. And David went home all perplexed about, wow. And I thought we was getting a visitation of God. And God struck my man dead. And, and somebody probably said to him, well, look, dude, you had it on a cart. Get two of your priests to carry the anointing. And if you get the anointing on them priests, everybody else will get the anointing. So he's seen that Obed-Edom's house was blessed, blessed, blessed. He said, I got to go back and get it. So he goes back down and he gets that ark. He's bringing that ark back in. I'm talking about a time of visitation. The anointing of God is coming back into Israel. David's carrying it right. It's coming back in in the ministry. They're carrying it right. They carry it. I don't, I don't, I won't go. I'm, I'll leave that alone. I'm about to say something I shouldn't say about, about people who think they don't need to be in the ministry. They have their own anointed high and mighty person that don't need to be in church. They got their own ministry. And, and, and you know, you ever seen them kind of people? I'm called anointed and appointed, but you don't ever support anybody but yourself. You're wrong. Hello. Now go with me. Go with me over to 2 Samuel. We're going to look at this story. 2 Samuel. Go to chapter 6. I'm talking about not missing the time of your visitation. We see somebody here who missed it badly. David's bringing back in that, that, um, that ark. Chapter 6, and look at verse um, Look at verse 13. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he, David, would sacrifice oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. I, I, I want you to think about that. From, from Obed-Edom's house back to Jerusalem, they say it was somewhere between 15 and 20 miles. David was praising God. He was going to get in his time of visitation. Every six paces, he'd stop and they'd slay an oxen 
And they'd sacrifice to God the blood of the blood of the oxen. And they'd have church and they'd praise God. And they'd go six more paces. And they'd stop. And they'd slay an oxen. I don't know how many oxen that he killed. I think I wrote down a number that somebody said. Let me see if I got it on these notes here. Um, uh, they said between 7,700 and 79. You, if, you, if you went six paces from Obed Edoms to Jerusalem, you'd be between 7,700 and 7,900 stops. They, they sacrifice, listen, they sacrificed close to 8,000 animals. He's bringing back the anointing, and it was a bloody trail. There was a blood trail for 15 to 20 miles. Y'all not listening to what I'm saying? There was a blood trail. For 15 to 20 miles. If you're going to get into the time of your visitation and get back into the anointing, you got to walk a blood trail, somebody. Yeah, you got to walk a blood trail. What you talking about? If you sin, we got to advocate with the Father and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. With all of his might, David's dancing and praising God. He gets back to Jerusalem. And all the people of Jerusalem fell out onto the streets. And the streets of Jerusalem are lined with the people of God. And David's praising and he's shouting and he's, he's leaping and he's dancing. And he's got his bands, hundreds of people in the band playing. And, 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 and then in verse 16, look at verse 16. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, who was his wife, David's wife, Looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. This woman had ice water in her veins, pride in her heart. And she was the self-appointed inspector general of the church. And she didn't like how David was praising God. And she thought she was better than him and that was beneath the king. I'm sorry if our praise offends you on Sundays. Maybe we're not as mature as you are. All I know is God took me off a dunghill and let me inherit a throne of glory. And God took me off an ash pile and put beauty on my ashes and gave me the oil of gladness for sorrow and gave me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Please don't let our worship offend you, but we're going to praise God in this house. Then in verse 20, I didn't turn, I shut my page, I shouldn't have done that. In verse 20, 2 Samuel, let me get back over there. She despises David in her heart. I love David's heart. David was going to get in his time of visitation. 2 Samuel, where, where am I at? 2 Samuel chapter 6. Why am I in 2 Kings? Y'all tell me why I'm looking in 2 Kings. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And then, 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 uh, look, look, uh, mm, Go down to verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. Man, he'd been in the anointing. This was his wife. He goes back up into his house to give them blessings and let that anointing get off on them. But she's done looked at him praising God and despised him. And he, and he goes back to his household and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today. Uncovered himself today in the eyes of the hands. Jealous. She was so jealous. In the eyes of the handmaids of his servant. Uh, as one of the vain fellas shamelessly uncovered himself. He danced his coat off, y'all. And she's jealous thinking the women was looking at her husband. And watch now. I love David. And <laughs> watch what he said. He ain't going to miss his visitation. He's, listen. Ladies, don't take no offense at me, but I've seen it a lot of times. Man try to serve God, and the woman not have a heart for God, and he'll mess around and get out away from God. And I've seen it the other way, too. You do not let your spouse keep you from going forward with God. Look what David said to her. She put her mouth on him. Put her mouth on him. And, 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 and look at David. And David said unto Michael, it was before the Lord. I, he said, I was dancing before the Lord. Watch now. Who chose me before your father. Yeah. Woo! Did you hear what I just said? I was dancing before God who, by the way, picked me over your daddy, woman. Uh, who chose me before your father and before all of his house. 
Your whole family's messed up. <laughs> to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. He said, don't bring your family junk up in here. I'm going to play before God. And I, oh, I love this. And I will be more vile than thus and will be based in my own sight. He said, lady, listen. You ain't seen nothing yet. He said, if you think I was crazy, I'm bringing back the ark of God. It's our time of visitation. If you don't like it, See, let me tell you, anytime you get a move of God going on in your life, somebody's going to put their mouth on you. And it's usually going to be your own family. They ain't going to understand you. They're not going to know what's going on. Boy, I could tell you some of the remarks I got from my family when this church got started. Well, especially when we built this when we first got here. I had no, uh, my, my parents, but other than that, from uncles and people, I had some make me want to cuss back at them remarks. Negative. Said, said, listen, you, you ain't seen nothing. Look what God did to her for, for her lack of response. See, you, let me say it again. He didn't care what she said. He was, he was, he was doing for God. You cannot let your family or people or friends Talk you out of what God's doing. You know, when, when, when the Spirit of God, the still small voice whispers to you, and you know God's starting a new season, a time of visitation, that He's told you some things He's going to do, it's usually not wisdom to share that with everybody. Look what happened to Joseph when he shared his dream. They don't understand what God's telling you. And most of them's going to criticize you. They don't even have a prayer life. Read, read their Bible on Sunday morning. They don't understand what God's doing in your life. Anybody ever experienced that? Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Yeah. Said um. Said in verse. Where do I want to be here? In verse um. Verse. Twenty three. He said, you ain't seen nothing. And in verse 23, he said, Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her birth. Now, can I talk to you as an adult? David had plenty of children. His seed was good. He produced all kinds of babies. But because this woman refused to get into the time of his visitation, she stayed barren. They married, I mean, we're all adults. No doubt David was given her seed. But sometimes God can put the seed of a miracle in you. And if you don't treat it with respect and treat it with worship and treat it with praise and, and, and give God glory for the seed that he's put in you, you'll never birth it. And she never had a child. Because she didn't want that visitation. God, God will do exceedingly above, above all you can ask or think. But he ain't going to do it if you don't want it. He's not going to force a move of his spirit in your life. <laughs> you got to open up to it and say, Lord, let me have my, my time of visitation. Let me have my time of vis visitation. Let me have my visitation. I, I, we got to have some zeal. We got to have some excitement about the things of God. Right in the middle of a mess, church, it's when you got to learn to put on the garment of praise. Right when they're talking about you. Right when they're working against you. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When the morning comes, I'm going to have my praise on. This is hard to do, but you got to learn standing by a gravesite to give God glory for who He is and what He's done. You've got to learn... When you're in the hospital to give God praise, you got to learn when you get that bad report that God's still God and I'm still expecting a visitation from God. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He said, you have missed the time of your visitation. He could see their full potential, what they was capable of, and they missed it. I wonder, does he weep over our lack of zeal? I wonder, does he... Weep over America's lack of interest in his kingdom. 
uh, J Jason McDowell, I seen, he posted a thing. He, he went last night to see uh, God's Not Dead, the movie God's Not Dead. It was, I think, playing two nights or three nights. He said, we went into the movie theater, and it was empty. Put out a movie about God, and it's empty. I wonder, does God look at, Israel, look at America? And all the trouble we've had these last two years, and this curse that's on us, called COVID. And he says, if you'll humble yourselves and seek my face and pray and repent and turn from your wicked ways, I will heal your land. What does God want to do with America? We've always been the beacon of the gospel. And we're slowly losing our ability. My uh, brother Robbie Strickland, y'all know our director in the DR, he called me yesterday and he said, Pastor Steve, he said, I've been down here 30-something years. He said, I've never seen this happen. He said, the dollar has lost value eight or ten months consecutively. And he said, the amount of money that you send in down here now every month is worth $270 less. <laughs> well, our money don't, don't buy as much. Do, do, do you not believe we might need to ask God to put a time of visitation on us? We need a visitation of God. We, 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 we need him to move in our, in our churches and, and move in our families. I, I love that scripture it says of Gideon when he was chasing, chasing the enemy. It says that him and his men were faint yet pursuing. I love when Samson said, Lord, I've been through a lot. I've made some mistakes. But I remember how your time of visitation was on me. I remember how your anointing was. And he's standing there with his eyes out in chains. And he says, Lord, just one more time. Just one more time. And you know his story. His heart burned with desire still. Here's what I taught you tonight for, for this reason. Let's ask God. Give us a desire. Give us a passion for a visitation from heaven that we haven't had in a long time. And ask him to visit you like you haven't had in a long time. Amen, everybody. If you enjoyed this message, please share. This message is on Facebook, YouTube, and Vimeo. So Feel free to share it with all your friends and loved ones. You, you can also check out other great messages just like this one by visiting setfree.cc, the Church Center app, or our YouTube channel, username setfreesc. Thank you again for watching. We pray you have a blessed day.